Okay, so the talk that I'm going to give you this afternoon is about some social psychologists whose work was inspired by the Holocaust. And it was inspired by their own experiences, whether they were in the Holocaust um, as victims or survivors, um, and whether their families were affected. But each of these people were Jewish and worked to try and understand what had happened in Europe um, during the time of the Nazis. Now, this is the sort of thing that they were trying to explain. Excuse me, I'm going to get my pointer. These gentlemen here were ordinary people. And these gentlemen here could well have been their neighbours only a year previously. So how is it possible that ordinary friends and neighbours can be doing this. These people here are using a machine gun to mow down women and children against a wall. These people here, these gentlemen here, have sat a bunch of people down in a row, men and women, and children and are firing bullets into their heads so that they will fall into a pit, a mass grave which will then be covered up. This chap here is walking past a ghetto, an area in which women and children are queued up starving for food. And he's marching past with a gun to make sure that they don't get out of this ghetto. Bearing in mind that this ghetto, just outside of it, could have been their ordinary homes where they'd been driven from and into this um, secluded area known as a ghetto. This chap here is directing these elderly people, women and children, to their deaths in gas chambers as they arrive at a internment camp. This is the effect of being in that type of camp. These people saw this every day. These were people who'd been literally starved and worked to death. Actually, this photograph was taken at the time that the camp was um, rescued um, by Russians. And here, I'd like to point out that it's not all men who took part in this. These ladies here are nurses, German nurses, taking these children either for medical experiments or possibly to be exterminated. There was no little child school in the concentration camps. So, what were the possible explanations which we're going to look at today for becoming a perpetrator within the Holocaust situation? The first explanation will be related to the type of society it was, so a totalitarian society. Is it because society became a totalitarian society that people within it were able to carry out such terrible active actions and it became normal? Was it conformity to the majority? If everyone else is doing something, is that enough to make you do it, even if you know that it's wrong? If everyone else does something, do we conform without thinking? Third, if a minority of people are consistently saying something, can they influence other people's beliefs? And we'll bear in mind that the Nazis at the start of the period were a minority who were very consistent in what they had to say. And finally, we're going to look at how, whether it's social identity based on group membership. So when you recognize yourself as a German and another group has been set up for you, these are German, Jews or European Jews, 
is it instinctive for you to start to discriminate against that group and in favour of your own group um, just by the mere act of being put in those groups? We're going to look at those four different explanations as we go through this presentation today. The first psychologist is called Kurt Lewin. Now, Kurt Lewin was born in Poland in 1810, so a long time before the war. 1910. Sorry, he was not born in 1810. He was born in 1910. Um, and he died in 1947. Is that possible? Yeah, it's my typing that's wrong there. He left the, for the USA in 1933. So he was in the USA by 1933 and he left when the Nazis came to power. He didn't manage to live for very long after the war, if you look. He definitely died in 1947. Most of the family he left behind in Europe did not survive the Holocaust. So this had a profound impact on him. And Lewin was interested in, because he fled when totalitarianism came. So he thought, OK, totalitarianism and authoritarianism has led to this terrible thing. The people I used to live with used to live in a democratic society where People used to have votes and things. They found themselves in an autocratic or totalitarian society where they were told what to do. And this meant that they were less able to question their actions and therefore more willing to do bad things. He felt that this wasn't the way their parents raised them. He felt this was about the society and the way society is set up. If you're being told that you must obey without question, you'll obey without question. And he did a study where he used children as his participants. And what he did with these children was he had them um, take part in craft activities. And one in particular of the activities was the uh, children had to make masks to wear on their faces, you know, creative masks. And he had one of the leaders of the groups be autocratic. Tell each child what to do. You take this, you put the elastic band on, you stick the nose on or whatever. And by the end of this, we've got a pile of masks. The masks all look the same, but we've got a pile of masks and they produce lots of masks. The democratic group, by contrast, were asked to do whatever they thought they should do. And what should we do? How should we do the masks? Let's take a vote. And they produced a wider variety of masks, but far fewer. So the autocratic group, these were more productive when it was mask making. But when they were given something more complex, like to create a short book on something, they found that the democratic group did better, they were more creative and they were more happy. The autocrats were less creative and less happy, but they produced lots and lots of these masks as long as they were all the same. One interesting thing was at one point he asked the leader to leave the room where the children were working for 15 to 20 minutes, but he carried on filming the children while they were unsupervised. The democratic group carried on with what they were doing with their masks or books or whatever. Whereas the autocratic group just stopped. As soon as the leader went, they stopped and started messing around and throwing things about and playing. And it was only when the autocratic leader came back that they got back on task. So it seems like they took less responsibility for the task that they were carrying out. So let's take this back to the societies that we saw um, during the rise of the Nazis and the beginning of the Second World War. And here you can see orderly, autocratic, totalitarian presentation with Hitler marching up the middle here and all of his troops lined up nice and neatly doing exactly as they are told. This is a totalitarian society. Here, you have a photograph of Allied troops getting ready to leave for the war. 
and you see a very much less organized group of people yes they're marching yes they're all in line yes they've all got guns but you can see they're smiling you can see that the um people who are dressed in different uniforms here are very much walking at their own pace whereas it's nobody out of place here so would these people because of the orderly state of their culture be less likely to disobey than these people who were in a more relaxed and democratic society? The answer to that is we don't know, but this is the explanation that Lewin gave us. The next psychologist I want to talk to you about is called Solomon Ash. Solomon Ash was born in 1907 in Poland. He was Jewish and he moved to America when he was 13. Now, during the 1930s, he's in America and he's studying the power of propaganda because what's he seeing in his home country of Poland and what's going on in Nazi Germany, which is all in the news? He's seeing propaganda being used to encourage people to change their views, particularly in terms of anti-Semitism. And as a Jewish person, he's very aware of anti-Semitism's rise across the world. And we have to remember that anti-Semitism was extremely influential in America at the time as well. Fascism was by no means um, confined to Germany and anti-Semitism was by no means confined to Germany. So seeing how propaganda could influence a uh, group of people to become anti-Semitic was something Ash was very interested in. After the Holocaust, however, he did his most famous work where he studied conformity to the majority. This means that when, other, when a group of people around you all start to do the same thing, you will tend to join in. If you're at, um, if you watch the crowds at a football game, when a player scores a goal and it's your team, the whole crowd stand up all together and go, yes. Now, if you're sitting there, the chances are that you'll stand up and go, yes. Even if you have no real affiliation to the team, but because everybody else is doing it, it's likely that you'll get up and do it as well. That's fine. But what if everybody gets up and starts making racist monkey chants towards one of the players? Now, there's a possibility that because everybody else is doing it, somebody who wouldn't think about doing that will start to get up and join in the monkey chants because everybody else is doing it. And Ash wanted to test this. So how did he test this? Well, he tested it with a really famous experiment. In his group of um, participants, he had a group of people who were working with him and an innocent person who'd come in to take part in the study. He, Ash told his participants that what he was studying was people's ability to see things properly. He was studying vision and judgment. And he'd show a line and then he'd show three other lines and you were expected to say which line was the same as line one. Now, at first, he had all these people say the correct thing. So on this occasion, the person would have said, so if he showed these three lines and this line, it's the same as line C. So they would go C, 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 C. And there's our person who agrees and says C. As it went on, if they were shown something like this, they'd be shown this line. It's obviously C, but this person says A, 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 A. Now, what's that person here going to say? Everybody else has said A. A looks like this. Here's the prompt. Here's the line they've chosen. Why have they chosen that one then? Well, for a while, most, some people would say mm, C. But it's hard to say C when everyone else has just said A. 
and after a few goes, most people would just say what the other people were thinking. And I'll just go back actually, I'll go forward to this up. And when he asked them afterwards, why did you do that? Why did you give the wrong answer? They would say, well, I thought maybe they had a better view than me. Maybe they could see better than me. Because if everybody else says something different, you actually don't believe your own eyes. You start questioning your own perception. Because why would four other people say this if it's not true, if it's obvious? So for our participant here, it gets very difficult to say what is true before your eyes. So now I'll go to this one. Here's a group of people who are, we might say, making bad decisions. They're all doing the Nazi salute. Now, if everybody around you is doing a Nazi salute and saying Heil Hitler, it's very easy to do a Nazi salute and say Heil Hitler. Doesn't mean you necessarily believe in Hitler, but you do start to question why everybody else believes it if you're the only one who doesn't. However, there is hope, and hope springs in the form of this chap here. He's in a whole stadium full of people hiling Hitler, but Citizen X there is not hiling Hitler. So, are we programmed to go along with the majority? The study we've just seen, Ash's study, suggests that yes, much of the time we are. My question here would be, it's okay if you're judging lines because it's got no consequence. What if you get it wrong? It doesn't matter. But if you are sentence if you're actually going along with a group of people who are rounding up your neighbors and sending them off to their death and this has become increasingly well known then you may be less inclined to um hire your hitler because it's got a real life consequence my next psychologist is called sergey moscovici he was born in 1925 in Romania, and he was Jewish and he was a communist. So he was double bad news for Nazis who did not like Jews and did not like communists. He witnessed the pogrom in Bucharest in Romania in 1941, when the people of Bucharest were, the Jewish people of Bucharest were rounded up, were shepherded out, were contained, and then were taken away and killed. And Sergei Moscovici himself became, was escaped, but was made, captured and was prisoner in a forced labour camp. Now, how did he become a prisoner in a forced labour camp and not a person who ended up in a death camp or a concentration camp? Well, he did so by lying about being Jewish. He lied about his Jewish identity, so he was treated as a prisoner of war rather than um, a Jewish person for execution and Holocaust for extermination. He then, he was freed by the Russians and he decided to join, uh, to go, to go along with the communist Russians because of course he'd been a communist, but he became really disillusioned quite quickly because he found that the uh, communists were just as anti-Semitic as the other um, cultures that he'd been in. And all, you know, he was a bit not, he was fairly resistant, shall we say, to anti-Semitism by this time. So he fled to France. Sergei Moscovici was the only member of his Romanian family to survive the Holocaust by the time he got to France. So the personal impact on him was extremely intense and he was a very troubled man actually for most of his life. His question was a different one. And his question was, what if, it's not everybody who's doing it, it's just a small number of people who are doing it because the Nazis started out small. 
you know, at first, there are only a small number of Nazis. So why would the majority become convinced by this small number of Nazis? So the study that Sergei Moscovici designed presented the participants with a different set of um, stimulus. First of all, here's his hypothesis. He felt that providing that our minority group are consistent, then the majority will be likely to follow their guidance. So, in this case, he had participants who were a consistent minority, okay? So a consistent minority might say, so our confederate here says green, green, and the subject says blue, 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 okay? Now, in this case, it would be this color. But when we got to this color and the consistent minority said green, green, then the rest of them, the participants who were innocent, were likely to say blue. If they said blue, blue, the rest would go blue. If they said green, green, the rest would go green. Now, even if they said it was this one and they said green, green, and the rest of the people, no, it's not, it's blue. So they went blue, 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 blue. The interesting thing was, even when the consistent majority minority were wrong, and they were blatantly wrong, if you later tested these people on their own, on an ambiguous slide like this one, which could be blue or green, you found that the people who'd been in the test with the people who said green were more likely to go green on an ambiguous slide. If these guys just said pretty much everything was green, wherever it was ambiguous, they said green. Even when it wasn't ambiguous, they said green. The more they said green, 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 the more these people were more likely to err on the side of green. So even though they could tell blue from green, they could tell right from wrong. When it came to an ambiguous situation, the consistent minority made them more likely to go in a particular direction. So let's ask ourselves here. Here's our consistent minority. They are standing outside shops. Now, whether you think they're right or whether you think they're wrong, they are consistent. They're doing it every day and they've got the same message. Even if it's the wrong message, every day, the same message from these people. They can slowly change the mindset so that when something is ambiguous, meaning when you're not sure, is that right or is that wrong? I'm, I'm not really sure whether that is right or wrong. These consistent minority people telling us this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Eventually, you think, well, they must know what they're talking about. And so gradually, this minority creeps its influence across the majority of people. Here's another minority who are trying to change people's views. These are the White Rose Group. And um, Sophie Schull here, she's 20 in this picture. They were a group of people who um, tried to object to the Nazis and she was executed age 21 um, for her part in this. That they, they tried to be a consistent minority, but they were a much smaller minority than this group here. So a consistent minority, a group of people who are consistent, always say the same thing, very clear about it, never stop saying it, gradually influence the majority to slide across to their way of thinking.
The last psychologist I'm going to talk to you about today is called Henri Tajfel. And Henri Tajfel was born in Poland in 1919. He was Jewish and he fled to France in 1939. He um, fought the French, fought in the French army. He was a prisoner of war. He's another one who uh, hid his Jewish identity to survive. He was the only member of his family and friends to survive the Holocaust. And he worked in France and then he worked in the UK. He was um, moved about quite a lot. He never really settled after the war, but he was very influential in his work. He wondered how, why do people discriminate against other people? Because he saw it everywhere. No matter where he went in the world, he saw the same thing. Oh, oh, let me go back. He saw it everywhere. He saw discrimination in France. He saw discrimination in the UK. Now, it might not be anti-Semitism. He saw racism. He saw um, misogyny. He saw people who were prejudiced against people who came from another part of the country or from a different religion. And he wondered, why do we see discrimination everywhere? And he felt that perhaps it's part of our programming as human beings, that as soon as you get put into a group, you find yourself being in favor of the group you're in. And quite increasingly, or straight away, you know that there's an us and there's a them. Us is good, them is bad. And that's pretty much automatic. He felt that that probably had even been an evolutionary thing that people find themselves in groups and it's in their interest to survive as a social herd animal. If you protect your own group and if you are hostile to members of other groups, that's better than being friendly to them because they're likely to threaten you. So how did he test this? Well, he got a bunch of schoolboys looking very much like these schoolboys. <coughs> Excuse me. And he presented them with a task to, dis to put them into groups. He asked them, which of these pictures do you prefer? And he showed them lots of pairs of pictures and they had to decide of the pictures which one they preferred. <clears throat> the pictures were by two artists. One is called Cl Paul Clay and the other one's called Vasily Kandinsky. They both look quite similar. They're both very abstract, colorful, geometric artists from a similar period. Schoolboys don't really care about abstract art on the whole. So didn't matter which ones these children picked because afterwards he took them in one by one and he said to them, okay, you're in group A because of the pictures that you liked. We'd like you, we thank you for taking part. It's interesting to see what you liked. What we'd like you to do now before you leave is we want to assign some rewards to the two groups to the group who likes the pictures you like, Clay group, and to the Kandinsky group. So here's some possibilities. And they got to distribute things fairly or unfairly. And what there were various options. What he found was that these boys didn't know who was in their group. They didn't know who was in the other group. They didn't really understand why they were in the group in the first place. They were just told, you know, you're a you like Vasily Kandinsky better than Clay. Well, so what? All of the boys knew each other, but they were taken in one by one. These children would favor the group they were told that they were in. And worse than that, they would be willing to lose money for their group if they could inflict more damage on the other group financially. Now, this study told Tajfel that as soon as you're in a group, as soon as we go around the classroom and tell you that you're in group one, group two, group three, when you go to a breakout room, then your breakout room is automatically the best breakout room out of the five breakout rooms. And even though that breakout room only lasts for 15 minutes of a discussion or the rest of a lesson, that your group automatically becomes a group that you will favor over the other groups. So for him, for Tajfel, this could help to explain why we see discrimination 
and why we're able to treat people in outgroups differently. Now, further studies on this by other people showed that people who we see as in outgroups, we tend to treat them as they're all the same as well. We're much happier to say all Jewish people are like this. But we think of our own group, not as let's say you think yourself as a Czech atheist, for example, you see the people in your group as a bunch of individuals, but the people in their group as a bunch of very similar people. They call it outgroup homogeneity, meaning all the people in the outgroup, they're just the same. But all the people in my group have different personalities and they are characters. So it's possible to treat the out group as if they're all one person, dehumanized. And therefore you can treat them very badly. So can creating an out group allow us to treat them inhumanely? The Nazis in Germany worked very hard to create an out group of Jewish people. They um, had posters, they had car, car caricatures, they taught it in schools that these were different people, they encouraged the German people to see Jews who previously had been very integrated, it's certainly in the urban Jews, to see them as outcasts, as different people. And as soon as you start to see them as different people, you label them with their yellow stars, then you can start to treat them as if they're less than human because they're not like us. We all have different personalities. They're just Jews, all the same, just Jews. And therefore we can do things to them that we wouldn't do otherwise to other human beings. Oh, he wasn't my last one, you better hurry up. Milgram, you've probably come across Milgram before anyway. It's one of the ones that uh, many of you would have studied. And Milgram was raised in a Jewish area where refugees um, fled from Nazi persecution. He grew up around families who'd lost their members and they were obsessed with the Holocaust. They were following the news. They felt absolutely destroyed by what had happened in Europe and they feared it could happen in America as well. His most famous study, which you probably will have come across before, was one where he got his participant to inflict increasingly high punishment on a person in another room. The experimenter, the person in authority here, would tell the person, you must now give an electric shock. This guy had to answer some questions. If he got one wrong, they'd say to this chap here, you must administer an electric shock. And the electric shocks got stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. This person in this room would scream. They would start off going, oh, ow, that's not very nice. And then by the end, they'd just go silent. There'd be a crash to the floor and they go silent and they tell him to administer yet another shock. The shock machine went from mild shock written beside it up to 450 volts danger of death. So. These people felt that they were giving shocks to the people in the person in the next room enough to kill them. And they'd turn around and say to the guy, they'd say to him, look, this guy's in trouble, can we stop? And he'd say, the experiment requires that you continue. Please continue. The next switch needs to be switched now. The experiment requires that you continue, carry on. And even if they said, but I, I don't want to, they would never say you must. They'd say, this experiment requires this, please press the next button. What Milgram found was that over 65% of the people were willing to go to the death point and believed they were shaking some of them, crying. Some of them were laughing ner you know, with nervous e excitement, not happiness, but their nerves made them laugh, their nerves made them cry, their nerves made them freak out and say, please let me stop. And they'd say, no, you must carry on. So that you could tell that they knew they were doing something wrong. But because this chap here, the experimenter, the man in the official uniform, in his lovely white coat, told them to carry on, these people carried on. 
So, what about this chap? He following orders? Do we think? Certainly all these people behind him might think so. This chap here? This guy here? who sat down and invented a mobile killing machine. This vehicle here is a, is a mobile death station. It's a gas chamber on wheels that they could drive around to more efficiently kill these people here. Could you watch people get to this state and then herd them into gas chambers? See the gas here? These are the gas chambers. Could you herd them in there because someone told you to do it? It's very hard to know. Certainly, this guy here, who was the man behind the organization of the final solution, he claimed that he was only following orders. This is him on trial for his um, crimes. And at this trial, Hannah Arendt says, she was a Jewish philosopher who went to observe this. And she says, no one has the right to obey. So what she's saying here is this is not really an excuse. So what can we learn from these findings that might help us understand what went on in the Jewish Holocaust? Well, Ash's participants, the ones with the blind judgment, 25% of them never conformed. They just carried on saying the right thing. Even if the majority were wrong, one in four never conformed to this. Let's be one of the 25%. And if just one person dissented and said, no, it's the right answer, conformity went to zero. Moscovici found that minority influence was less than 10%. It was there, but it was less than 10%. And again, where the minority were inconsistent, the conformity reduced to practically zero. Not all of Tajfel's schoolboys discriminated against their classmates. Some of them just gave the fair portioning out of money you know, if it was break it down 10, 10, they'd say, yeah, give 10 to our group, 10 to the other group. There were a significant minority, even of the schoolboys who didn't do what they were asked to, they didn't discriminate. And those with higher self-esteem were less likely to discriminate. And it seemed like having low self-esteem made you more likely to join a group and more likely to act with your group against other groups. So higher self-esteem, more individuality meant that you were less likely to discriminate against others. And in every reconstruction of Milgram's experiment with the electric shocks, at least 35% of participants refused to go to the end. Some won't even start, but 35% at some point refused to obey the orders and they stop and say enough is enough. So the message coming out of this, a lovely Facebook meme, is speak the truth even if your voice shakes. Be the person who turns around and holds up their hands to fight back the crowd. Now I'm going to jump past my neck and oh no, I'm going to stop with this one. This is Sophie Scholl just before she was executed. These are her final words, and they're the words I'd like to leave you with at the end of this presentation. How can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give himself up individually to a righteous cause? Such a fine sunny day, and I have to go. But what does my death matter if through us Thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action. And I hope that many of you like me will find it inspirational that these young people at that time were willing to give their lives for something that they truly believed in. And they were willing to be the ones who stood up and spoke truth to power, even if their voices shook.